I'm Knut. Welcome to In My World. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this channel. Hit the notification bell so you get to be the first one to see the videos when they're out. Now, my guest today has been making waves for many decades. He has inspired me since day one and still true to this day, simply because of his work ethics and his attention to detail. He's taught me so many things, routing, the importance of gain staging, and so much more. He's a broadcast engineer, a recording engineer, a musician, and just an all-around cool guy. Help me welcome Stephen Cunningham. So Stephen, how important is gain staging? It's the most important feature of all recordings and all broadcasts. It's, it's what either kills you or keeps you. <laughs> I'll give you a great example. I had a wonderful example a couple of weeks ago. I was at this place where we had an active split. So we had an analog stage split and uh, the guy went to his Yamaha mm -hmm. and he, um, I had my uh, optical, which was feeding off to the uh, digicals. So we had our separate digital stage boxes. But for some reason, he had one of the new Sure radio mic systems with face mics and hand mm -hmm. mics. We had two hand mics, mm -hmm. two face mics. And... Uh, it sounded great at setup. He was taking Dante and I was taking the analog split because I didn't have Dante on my setup. So he was structuring his Dante levels for his front of house. But my analog output was also being changed, which we didn't know at the time until we got into the first broadcast. We'd done tests where you kind of give it enough headroom and you think it's fine. Uh, the reality was once the preacher got up there, once he started putting in his energy, like preachers do, the very dynamic, as you know, mm -hmm. he was squaring off. I could hear the saturation, but I'm looking going, my gain is hitting like neg 12. There's no way it was redlining. Go down into the venue, and it kind of sounds okay, but I was getting square. And I was saying to him, well, oh, can you just adjust the gain structure on the input to the mics? And he was saying, well, no, because it's good for me. Because I'm a house engineer. Now, the relationship between the recording engineer and the front of the house engineer has to be sweet. And sometimes it's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what I found out was his Dante gain structure for him when he was increasing it was too much for my output. But there wasn't any threshold where I could switch from mic to line. I was already online. There was nowhere for me to go. So what I was able to do was negotiate that he came down on the Dante side and used his faders a bit like what we did in the MT truck, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was able to get a pure, clean sound. So gain structure is crucial, especially when you have multiple sources and feeds of different people mixing. So it's important that when you set up, that, especially in the digital world now, the whole minus 12 things are good ceiling to work with because of the dynamic range. And obviously, we have LUFs now, loudness unit, full scale to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how that works with you in the mastering world these days. I'm a little bit out of touch with that now because although I master records, I work about minus three on output mm -hmm. because I found it sounds better on iTunes and the digital yes, platforms. Yes, it does. Um, so I allow that headroom. A lot of people used to just saturate it, bang, hit zero, and mm -hmm. you know, really crush it in there. Mm -hmm. On the acoustic music I do now, I have to allow that. So gain structure, I hope that helps you, is everything gets key. Yeah. If you don't get the gain structure, you've got no stable point to start making your balances. Yeah. What, so happen when, what happens yeah. when you don't sound check? When you don't sound check, you get a really bad reputation, eh? but you've got to do it on the fly. So when you get into festival mixes, you kind of know what's coming. There's a festival set where, you know, at least the drums are going to be there, acoustics are going to be there, keyboards are there. In general, a good festival set, you get maybe two or three seconds of tick, 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 it's there, and then you've got to get on your mix. Mm -hmm. So you have your presets, your drum, EQs, compressions, and various your EQs on your vocals and compressions, your reverbs are kind of in place. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be pretty quick, and it's always song one is the sound check. Mm -hmm. Song two, you're tweaking the vocals. Song three, you're sitting yeah. into the balance. Yeah. So, you know, uh, sound checking is crucial, but you don't always get that privilege. And sometimes that can bite you. Mm -hmm. You know, people are uh, 
people are quite disrespectful because they don't really understand the process. And it's like, oh, it sounds rubbish, that. But it's like, well, yeah, but maybe he's had 10 minutes. Like, I would yeah, really yeah, 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 you know. yeah. So, How important is the broadcast position, Nick's position? Because most churches, most churches have a front of house and they do monitors off of it and they kind of like do an OGS. Um, that's kind of either pre and post, <laughs> pick your <laughs> pick your poison, <laughs> and then um, they kind of just think, well, somebody's online yeah. watching, you know, um, and they don't mm. really have mixed position broadcast, mixed position. How important is um, that? I mean, it, it's very important, but a lot of churches don't take it into consideration. Even my church, which is a, a Nigerian gospel church that I go to when I'm home, mm. we put an X32 in there and you get the same deal. It's mm -hmm. front of house, it's monitors, and then I've set up an aux that's got a TV mix on it, uh, yes. which is basically the front of house mix that's getting squashed a bit. And it's mm -hmm. like, they go, oh, but it doesn't sound like it does in the venue. It's like, no, it's never going to do that. What we need to do actually is put another mixer upstairs and he can balance or she can balance the TV mix because mixing for TV is so different to mixing in the room. You, you've, you don't really hear some of the, you get a lot more detail in the TV mix because you're on smaller speakers and it's, it's more detailed. When you're in a large PA environment, you've got the energy that's hitting you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that live moment's come and gone. Mm -hmm. But the replay is where it bites, you know? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. hear that replay and I think, oh, yeah. okay, I've got to tweak this next week. Or, and you've got to remember, source is everything. Yeah. Them musicians at Soundcheck yeah. are playing at probably like 60%. As soon mm -hmm. as they go into the full-on worship, you've got to allow, and that's part of the game structure, you've got to allow for that yeah. extra 40% that's going to come on when they hit worship. Say that again, source is what? Source is key to everything. There so you go. Musicians are not delivering. There's not a lot we can do with it. We have mm -hmm. some tricks in our box. But mm -hmm. if that source isn't good... Yeah. The angle make it better. And it's the same for singers, right? If a singer just gives you ah, nah, I, that sound I check. I work with six singers in my church. I, I work with six singers, and I make each one of them sound check individually when I'm doing front house. And they, they cringe. Yeah. And it's going, you're not putting enough in. I need some more. Yeah. Because I don't want to be putting more gain in to then have feedback. And they're going, it's feedback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come in on the mic. This is a dynamic mic. You need to be here, mm -hmm. you know, not here, mm -hmm. unless you've got somebody who's a belter. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you get the backing singers and they're a bit, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I encourage them from my front of house position. Very rare I do that, but when I do it, I go through each indoor as one. Give me yeah. more, give me more. And the worship leader loves that mm -hmm. because she knows she's going to get the input she needs yeah. that I need to be able to deliver. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, you're a hands-on person. I've been there with you on your setup when you're doing broadcast. You're there kind of making sure everything, your microphones are in place and all that stuff for you. Um, what, what, what's your process yeah. like? What's your setup process is like when you're on the road? Um, I have some key things that I like to have, and it's not always the PA friendly mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. And you've got to get that balance. So that's why the relationship with the front of house guy is key because what I've always said to front of house is your event is coming on in that three hours. My event can live on for three, four, five, ten years yeah. that I need to capture. So that, that the communication and that relationship is key. And if that doesn't work and the front of house guy is going, no, I've got to have this mic on, I've got to have that. Well, okay, I'll work around it. If there's no negotiating there, I might try and sneak in that bass drum mic that I would like on that occasion. Um, but generally now, you know, the mics across the board, they're so much better than they were like 10, 15 years ago. Yes, yes. So you're finding a lot more front of house guys are able to work with condenser mics better because mm -hmm. a lot of people are on in years. Mm -hmm. The stage levels come down. Mm -hmm. The big secret to a good broadcast mix is the front of house is like 10 dB lower than it normally would be. Yeah. And that allows the TV mix to breathe, especially when you want to use ambience. Mm -hmm. Why is ambience important? Well, people at home want to feel that they're not listening to a record, they're looking at a live event. Yeah. But that whole ambience experience is key, that that's blended in. 
some people say you mix too wet some people say you mix too dry it's a fine balance to get that ambience right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i love it and you know some people might laugh at this but on occasions when the, the crowd or the congregation are singing i'll even tweak reverb onto that ambient mic as well just to give them a bit more spin as well you know yeah and that nice. really works a treat nice nice yeah. that's nice so there you go. um you know i've i've heard uh, a lot of people um just like you said some people like it dry some people like it wet um i've heard you make a statement uh a while back that you know it's not about you it's really what you're wanting them to the experience you want for them you mm. know um and like you i've put myself in the shoe of the person that's at home listening whether they're listening in their earpods on their mm. their computer or their television that's what we're mixing for. It's not for the big PA, you know, and sometimes those little speakers translate way different than if you have, um, you know, near field monitors. Mm. Now, do you I mean, use smaller near field monitors or what size near field monitors do you use? I'm very much a Genelec fan. And the reason why I love the Genelecs, even the small ones, mm -hmm. is because I can listen to them for long hours. So if you're doing a 15, 18 hour day, we know you know how these conferences work you have four sessions a day and in the breaks you're sound checking so mm -hmm. you you very rarely you're getting a bathroom break you're getting a sandwich break but you you're listening all day the genelex for some reason i've found for many years give me a good representation of what i would like to simulate mm -hmm. and i can listen for a long time and what i've started doing over many years is i listen at such a quiet level as long as I'm above the air conditioning system in the truck or the venue. Really? I'm telling you, I listen at such a low level. And you'll find when you're at the low level, your balance is so much better because the detail mm -hmm. in the mix. I mean, you get all your vocals sitting right. You get that kick drum and snare drum and you hear the bass guitar, the 125 yeah. hertz on the gate, that you just tweak a little bit on the bass. And at the low, low level, that's where your final mix should be. So I'll listen to a lot of stuff very low. Occasionally, if the band's rocking out, I'll crank it up mm -hmm. for like, you know, a song. So yeah. yeah, it's great. And then it comes back down again. And I can sustain mixing long periods of time. And I can also get my balance better at that low level. And for some yeah. reason, it seems to translate on all platforms. Wow. In your, in your laptops, on your iPhone. As you say, people are listening on the pods now. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's got, you know, the big heavy bass headsets. and. Mm -hmm. You know, audio has transpired amazing nowadays on how many platforms. I was watching a movie on my phone the other day, a movie, you know, mm -hmm. and the spatial awareness of the mix because of how they're, um, yeah, you know, have the surround thing that's working in movies. Yeah. And I was, I was, had the phone in my hand, but I was hearing like stuff out of that field, you know. Wow. What's your favorite console, Stephen? It has to be an SSL. Um, any of the SSLs. Um, and coming, coming down to basics, uh, I'm working a lot on DigiCores at the minute. Yeah. And I'm just having to get myself around them and enjoy the process. Um, the dynamic side of DigiCores, I'm not enthralled with. I've, I've always liked the, um, for music, SSL is the way forward. I mixed on a C100 some years ago in Kansas. And I was quite surprised because I could hear the sonic difference that over an, an MP3, like a stream. Mm -hmm. I could hear the mm -hmm. harmonics. I could hear the, uh, there was no digital artifacts mm -hmm. in, in the stream that I was getting off of the mixes. You know, the cheaper the Yamahas and your various smaller, uh, the M7s and things like that. Mm -hmm. So any SSL, I absolutely mm -hmm. love. I mixed on a car wreck recently, but it wasn't very uh, musical. Mm -hmm. Um, and everything nowadays is budget related, you know, going down to uh, your X32s. And I'm never yeah. going to knock an X32 because for <laughs> the money, the sound yeah. that it produces yeah. is insane. They have it's a new insane. one that's out now that's supposed to be insane with what they give you yeah. for the money, the wing. Um, yeah. I can't wait to get my hands on it. But uh, for everything that I've seen so far, it's really, you know, really some good stuff in there. Bang for buck. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Studer, Studer are producing. I, I know you use, uh, so I, I've seen you use uh, the VI series and the SI series quite a bit on your post yeah. and stuff. 
Yeah, how you yeah, find they're, those through there? They're great. And mm-hmm. uh, sound reproducing this, it's, it's when you get in the TV is predominantly speech and some music and sometimes it comes from tracks, but when you're doing live music, mm-hmm. um, it's finding the musicality and the tones. Mm-hmm. Um, Digico does it to some extent, um, but maybe I just haven't found the right dynamic thing where I'm comfortable with how I slam the dynamics. Because sometimes yeah. for TV, you also want to use your compression quite, not mm-hmm. killing it, but you want to control it. Yeah. And especially with the preachers we work with, the dynamic range go from minus 60 to like plus 20 in a nanosecond, you know? <laughs> and the Lord's and it's, like, ah! <laughs> it's, like, it's like, so you want to try and get that evenness where you want the dynamic yeah. range. But yeah. You want to kill the people at home, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you're not blessed to have real estate all the time. So you have to kind of like scale your console down. How, how thrilled are you about that? Um, the older I'm getting, the more I like less real estate. <laughs> really? It's the truth, you know? Uh, yeah, it, it is. I mean, la- last week when we did a music event, we used all 70 channels on the console. That's including playback, some comms that we had to use the mixer for, um, and then mix effects, and four channels of mix effects. You know how it is. It's... Uh, you have a small room, you have a large room, you have your tap delay, you have a, another room that you may want to put things in. So 70 channels is kind of the average of a gig nowadays. You know, I, I, I used to get I used to get everything in 24 channels once because you used to sub the toms and you would submix certain things. But uh, nowadays, because everything's isolated, coming in the streets, yeah. um, yeah, that's the average. So, yeah, change. I mixed a song here last week. I'm in Atlanta um, at the studio, and um, I mixed a song that had about 70 um, channels. And I was scrolling by, I was like, this is too much. The drums alone was like 16 channels. <laughs> I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, I had to squish that into left and right, you know, to put that in a stereo field isn't an easy thing. Um, but you know, I know what you mean, but you say minimum 70. So you're yeah. fine with the, the, the scale down real estate for what you're having these days. Yeah, exactly. And because of consoles, it took me a little while to get around cause I was used to the 128 channel SSL yeah. studios yeah. and it's all in one line, right? Yeah. But because of consoles now you've got like 24 channels, but it's five layers. Mm-hmm. And you've got to set your console up whereby I do everything on old school VCAs or DCAs, as yeah. they call them now. So I do, I mix my final show on probably about 10 faders. Mm-hmm. And then I go back to the different layers to do the odd tweaks if the gain structure changes slightly, where maybe the singer has moved off the mic and I want a bit of it. So once I've got my initial mix set up, I'm down to 10 faders to run mm-hmm. the whole show. Yeah. Um, That's cool. I found that was the easiest way of doing it. I spent two years working with a producer called Chaz Chandler. Mm-hmm. Now, he was uh, very famous for m- managing and producing Jimi Hendrix. Mm-hmm. He did a band called Slade. And the two years that I worked with him, I learned how to record live recordings because he would never really do a lot of dubbing. He had the band in the studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, we used to record on to two inch at 30 uh. inches. Mm-hmm. 24 tracks and he would make yeah. me do the, he would make me do the edit so if he wanted to edit eight bars out, splicing tape i would physically i would cut the tape with no <laughs> control z right uh, i love it i'd make a mark make a mark cut it uh-huh. stick it together with sticky tape uh-huh. make sure the beats worked and then i would do it actually on the, i used to do it on quarter inch first and then do it on the master uh-huh. and um he was the one that taught me how to get like performances out of the bands to get the energy. Mm-hmm. I used to all go on 24 track max, and honestly, the uh, mm-hmm. the sound energy used to get. Now, the reason I'm going back to you were talking about 16 mics, mm-hmm. he had a phrase that was called one in them and two somewhere near. And how he set uh, up, you would have a kick drum and an overhead. But if you listen to that 60s style music, especially when you get to the Hendrix type stuff, because of the energy in the room, mm-hmm. He just used the room and mm-hmm. close overhead, one in them, two someone in. Mm-hmm. And that's how he got their drums, you know? 
Mm. It had such a liveness and such a realness and all the yeah. overtones were there, you know? Yeah. It's horses for courses. Yeah. So I see you have, um, you're, you're in a band now, right? Are you playing, you're currently playing I play in, in a band? Right? Bands. Yeah. Yeah. So I, many I, see you, I see you um, have like recordings at your spot that you have like, you know, people with their guitars and they're just in a couch in, in, a, in a, like a living room and just recording. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that must be fun. It's so relaxed. And the reason I built the studio at home was because I was traveling so much and still am. Mm-hmm. When I go home, I want to have my space. Yeah. And if I'm going to get up at two in the morning and go into my room, then I can do that. If I feel creative, I want to switch the gear on and mm-hmm. do that. But to have people to come home and record in the kitchen or record upstairs, um, it works. Home recording now is the way. That it's, it's very yeah. rare that you get the big studios. Yeah. And because of the equipment that's available and the prices, mm-hmm. people can get enough time. And that clock's not ticking. You know where you're thinking, yeah. 30 bucks an hour, 40 bucks an hour, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. You know, you go down, you have a cup of tea, and if you spend an hour talking and reminiscing, yeah. and, okay, let's go and do some more music. It's so relaxed, but the performances become better because people are so relaxed that they're not thinking about the clock. Yeah, they're not thinking about the clock, and they're not thinking, oh, red light, I have to go because of this, they're just relaxed, and if, if you don't sure. get it right, you go and come again. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's cool. I think when I see those photos that you put and some of those videos, um, I know it's not an easy task to execute that. And, and, and for, for those of you who are watching in my world right now, don't think that you could just stick um, anything in your living room and record it. You have to take into account a lot of things like your AC, you know, driving cars by, um, you know, so many things. But most importantly, how you mic those instruments. Those are the key. You know, uh, so, you know, it's it's kind of like one of those things, Stephen, like, don't try this at home, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they say, oh, I yeah. could do that and do it. But it's not, you know, you see your things come out and it has 60 cycle hum on there and you don't know how, you exactly. know, how, how those things, you know, happen. Uh, yeah. Those are those are some of the things that you, you know, calculate for. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's about the right mic and the right position. And that comes from exactly. experience. Yeah, People should exactly. try it, you know, mm-hmm. and spend time experimenting mm-hmm. and uh, coming up with the different sounds. You're right about the traffic. I mean, I have double glazing, but you still get that sub on you know, so you yeah. filter that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously, tools like Isotope help to mm-hmm. some degree. Mm-hmm. But again, it comes down to the sources. All I want is our musicians to perform. Mm. And it's my job to put the mics in the right place with the right configuration yeah. and get the gain structure right. Yeah. And it'd be sweet, you know. Yeah. Good man. So we so we have this we have this thing that's kind of starting here on In My World where I put people on the spot and I ask them gear. So I'm gonna ask you, there's no wrong or right answer, Stephen. What sure. DAW what DAW is the DAW of choice for you? Okay, I'm currently using Reason Eleven. Reason to record yeah. and mix? Absolutely. I can't believe this. I picked <laughs> you for some sonar or something of, of um, Reason 11. Wow. I, I got into Reason when it was at version 3, when it was just a synth and sound module. Yeah. And I've been using things like Pyramix for <laughs> TV mixing, right? That was Pyramix was my oh. choice. Great mm-hmm. engine. Sounded good. Tried Pro Tools. It wasn't very uh, intuitive to me. Hey, watch out there. <laughs> hey, I know, you're the guru on the Pro Tools, but I've seen your demonstrations. So I used to use uh, Cubase. I mean, I used to have an Atari STE yeah. uh, with like half a meg of RAM for the MIDI and half a meg for the program. Yeah. So I started with Cubase very early on. It was very intuitive. I could work with it. I had a Roland W30 16 track sampler, so I could put vocals in there and I could do the MIDI. Yeah. Um, When Reason came along, it was like, this is great, but wouldn't it be good if I had an audio engine? So I used to rewire with Pyramix for my audio. Yeah. And have since working on rewire with uh, Reason to run the tracks and programming various things. Mm -hmm. And then when they brought the engine out, I now have a one box 
that I understand, mm. that I can route things properly. And I use um, a Sony DMX R100, which oh, okay. has Sony, Sony Oxide Dynamics in it. And I run that over MADI between mm. my recording and the desk. So there's a couple of things. If I'm doing something that's very acoustic or very dynamic ranged, I'll reroute everything back through the desk and use the dynamics in there. But then if I want to do something quick, I've got mm. Sony Oxfords. I've got my Waves. I've got uh, all, all of the stuff that sits in on plugins mm-hmm. um, that I can do very quickly in the box. But, you know, mm. I know for a fact, even if it's more like 5 or 10% to mm. mix back through that console, Mm-hmm. the air it just gives it so much more space so yeah. if time allows i put everything through the mixer bring it right. back it depends on the channel count you know because yeah yeah there's summing stuff or you're going to be uh using i can only use 48 channels on that console mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. wow wow i didn't um so i've been using reason from reason one and Ooh. it was just this little quirky thing with yeah. The re-drum in there was amazing. Like, Absolutely. you know, the drum machine with the step loop, the, the yes. step print, and 16 buttons, and you just find it, it and find a swing and stuff. Um, I never actually uh, got into the recording portion of it from version three, like you said. But, yeah, um, yeah Reason has always been, like, one of those solid sequencer. Um, it's it's, it's cool. unbelievable now. Yeah. It's so, so good. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. The TV, I'm still using Pyramix, mm-hmm. which is a for editing to picture. Mm-hmm. It's just really good. Nice. Uh, it works so well. Nice. Now, what's your thoughts on having plugins on the road, which is kind of like, you know, most people are using like the waves. Now, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. I think they're great when they work. You know, if you have the server sitting there, you've got to spend a lot of money, though. Uh-huh. I had some issues in India when I was working in India because maybe the setup we had at that time, the latency was an issue. Mm-hmm. I think it's much better now with the server where it's probably zero latency, but yeah. I couldn't put anything on there because I had lip sync to consider and think uh, to picture. Mm-hmm. So the actual setting up the time delays and everything, it's not a quick process. It takes time to figure out what the latency is. and Yeah, and cross that. your finger and hoping that it works. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, th- I think it's relatively stable now. It hasn't proved many times. I see a lot of people coming up there. In fact, the, the desk that I had the other week had the Waves uh, plugins on there, so you could use all of that. And that seemed to work quite well. Right. But um, I, th- I think it's important if, if you can make it work and it's stable, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's just making sure. I've been on a, on a mix with a very large group once where I was a more guarantee engineer role on the mixer. Mm-hmm. And the server failed. So you had to go through and knock out all of these inserts and go to the standard on body. Uh, it was, again, on a Studio console. Yeah. And do you know what? The actual sonic difference was, like, minimal. And I was Ooh. kind of laughing inside because I was thinking, yeah, <laughs> okay. But I think you'd yeah. have a big drop and it wasn't. It wasn't. So, you know, a lot of things with sound, and that's not disrespectful to anybody, but it's like when you've done it and you know it, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of what we call psychoacoustics going on. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's great. Yeah, that system works, that plug. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to use that. But if you swapped it out for a standard, what would the actual difference be? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I think it's minimal. So. Mm-hmm. What's your most memorable moment on the on the road, whether it's a show, traveling, or um, just on set? Um, goodness, there's been so many, really. I mean, <laughs> mi- mixing in the back of a van in the middle of the desert and having to use the car uh, air conditioning system to try and keep me cool at 40 degrees, um, being up mountains, mixing live shows up a mountain of Ben Nevis. Um, Absolutely stunning. Actually, recording uh, chat interviews in the twin prop plane at maybe 24,000 feet and having to sort of uh, keep the speech audible, you know. Whoa, 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 whoa. Time out, Stephen. What? <laughs> Run that back. Run that back. What? Okay, so like uh, traveling Africa, you know, and we have a plane and uh, the, uh, the lead guy decides he wants to do an interview on the plane. 
And it's like, okay, but you know, you're in a twin prop and you're 24,000 feet and there's a lot of noise, but you've got to get that speech. Luckily I had decent mics. I used to use the um, Sennheiser 416s and I had two of them, which I was able to position where you got enough of the speech and enough of the buzz of the plane to know that you were on a plane, but make it very, very audible. Um, record, recording in Laguna Seca uh, at a racetrack was amazing. To be in the pit and uh, having to tap into the comms to be able to record the car recording uh, so you could hear the engineer speaking to the driver and then also have the prayers interview going on at the same time and capturing all of this buzz. It's a different world, you know, but it's still sound. Yeah, it's still like mixing music. You still mix it like mix music. You've got oh to get the balance goodness. of the engines right again. Take me with you, Stephen. Take me with you. I want to record out of a plane. Probably, really? probably. Uh, have you jumped out and record somebody in the air? No, I, I, I'm not very. That's next. Good with <laughs> <laughs> that one is next. Oh my god, that's awesome. Yeah. That is so amazing. Life, life as a sound guy, especially in the TV world puts you up some amazing challenges, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, vision people do not want to see sound. Mm. You know? You say, you say, well, how does that sound? Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. Thing. But you've got to somehow be discreet how you hide the microphone, yeah. but still be able to capture the sound. You know? Yeah, yeah. Different A words. broken fiber with three hours to spare. Tell us. Okay, do you want me to tell you a little bit about that? <laughs> tell me a little bit. A broken fiber, three hours to spare. Yeah. What was that okay. like? Were you sweating bullets? Were you like, oh my goodness? So I'm down in India and I'm there as a technical supervisor by myself with an Indian crew. And the Indians are lovely people, such a heart-filled people, but they'll send three people to do one person's job. And it's 40 degrees in the, the tent that we're mixing in. I've got 15 people in a five position uh, personnel. So I have to go each round each one. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? So I find out, I find the five best people. Regardless, I says, you're all getting paid. It doesn't matter. You're coming here, but I need 10 of you out and just five in here. I set everything up. We had a fiber line that came 600 meters from the street into the field. I set it all up, I made the connection. I was able to do a test. It comes to time to go home. I'm happy. The signal was working. I go to bed, I sleep. I come back nine o'clock in the morning and my fiber is snapped and coiled up on the ground. Oh my somebody'd, goodness! Somebody'd come in in the middle of the night with an air conditioning system on the top of their bus, hadn't seen the fiber, snapped the cable so i ring the provider and said you know the thing is that the cable snapped we've got five hours to go to air and he said but the person that has the special splicing machine is two hours away i says you need to get on the phone to him and get him here now because i don't know how long this thing's going to take the splice and even if it's going to work once it's spliced and i think you might have seen the video mm -hmm. the guy comes in there he cleans it all off. He puts it together. He takes his own sweet little time. <laughs> as soon as he makes the whole thing. He takes his own sweet little time. He makes the whole thing completely.
That's crazy. So you made it work. <laughs> yeah. Plugged it back in, and it's like we're on air. Boom. Incredible, like you know. <laughs> so that was good fun, but it keeps you. Uh, well, it keeps you humble first and yeah. foremost, which we've got to do, and keeps your eyes on God, because yeah. we believe that you know He's the provider. You know, and uh, that was just uh, something that kept me going in it. Once you finish these things, you kind of laugh. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And we did it again, and you go to the next experience and see what's around the corner. But <laughs> I think for anybody who gets the opportunity, it's important to travel because we all do things differently. Mm-hmm. And I've learned so much about thinking out of the box with the traveling. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a slightly different story, and depending on whether you want to use it or not. But I had a very high profile interview in an Indian, uh, in a hotel in India with a high profile um, individual out there. And uh, I'd ordered three cameras. I had the portable sound equipment, which wasn't portable at all. It was like a couple of car batteries <laughs> and uh, various things. Mm-hmm. And uh, we get to the hotel and the guy tells me, oh, I've got a problem, Steve. Um, uh, I have no lighting. It hasn't come back from rental. And the lights you've ordered are not here. And he pulls out a piece of wood that's like, I don't know, maybe he's a, what would you say, three feet, four feet long. And he'd put 60 watt light bulbs on, six 60 watt light bulbs, a pair of bare ends, right? And he plugs it in the wall with two matches because it hasn't even got a plug on it. I said, what are you going to do with that? He says, I'll just sit here. I says, but the interview could be 30, 40 minutes, could be an hour. He says, I'll not move. I'll just sit there and hold it. So I have to tell my boss, what you're about to see, you'll not like. But it has to work because it's all we've got. And he was, I says, we've got like 10 minutes. It's not going to happen. And if you don't like it, we just have to work with it. That guy sat there for an hour, cross-legged with this piece of wood with all the bulbs on. He didn't flinch. He sat there and held them lights. And honestly, that made me, that made me think there's always always a solution to do something different mm. it might not look pretty but if it works it works and in audio recording world that's the same process don't be mm. too blinkered to how other people have done things there's so mm. many ways of achieving things and don't don't narrow your mind mm. just always think because that's what brings creativity and that what brings differences and especially for sounds and how music's made nowadays and things, you know. Mm-hmm. So on that really, note, really note on that. on that note, what what would be your encouragement to a broadcast engineer? A broadcast engineer today from mixing audio, or a broadcast engineer across all of the spectrum? What is it you're thinking? Uh, probably across the spectrum. Across the spectrum, the most important thing for people to do these days is keep up with technology. Mm-hmm. We live in an industry that's fast changing. The software and solutions that are coming out that tick many boxes and it's finding something that works for you in that particular application. Don't get bogged down with one thing. Keep your mind open and always keep up to date. Trade shows, everything that's on magazines. Keep in touch with the reality of what people are doing nowadays. And sometimes you can get ahead of the game as well by looking at things and using them in different ways. And that would be my biggest note is just to keep ahead of the game, you know? Keep reinventing yourself. Yeah. Because technology does. Wow. Wow. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. What you do in your spare time, Stephen? Do you have spare time? Well, not so much. <laughs> I mean, I try to grab a little bit of sleep. <laughs> sleep? <laughs> you do sleep in your spare time. <laughs> I like oh oranges. I love oranges at the moment. I'm going through a lot of oranges. Uh-huh. Um, and music. Uh, it's just keeping on top yeah. of the music, you know. I like to play when I get the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always dabbled. And as I say, I was a pro musician. And when that kind of mm-hmm. came to me, I didn't lose heart, but I kind of had to move on and do different yeah. things. You know? yeah. but it's great to go back home and just pick up the bass or whatever. And just mm-hmm. have a bit of fun with guys, you know. Yeah. For me, it's more about social interaction, about the people, mm-hmm. and then the music follows. Yeah. So it's yeah, socializing yeah. the people, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, so what are some of the bands you're playing in now? So currently I'm playing with uh, Tony Bankston, who's a, an Americana singer-songwriter, just produced mm -hmm. his album. Mm -hmm. uh, last year I was playing with a Northern Soul outfit. Mm -hmm. Great bass lines, great bass lines to play with. Mm -hmm. um, so they were the last couple of bands that I've played with, and I've supported many artists over the last mm -hmm. seven or eight years who have come into my label. We've done recording, we've made videos for them, we've uploaded it on mm -hmm. all the digital platforms. Yeah, and then you try and get the marketing, you know, and get the shows mm. going, and uh, keeping it fun. Yeah, for me, it's not about money; it's about it's an expensive hobby, but an enjoyable mm. hobby. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Stephen, thank you so much for taking time to talk with us. I totally admire you, your work ethics, your attention oh, to detail you. since since uh 2012 um i wow. i've i've patterned most of your techniques um i'm gonna confess <laughs> and um every one of your videos i watch yeah. intently to see what i can grab because i absolutely love broadcast yeah. i think it's the hybrid between studio and live and i'm a live engineer yeah. and a studio engineer and broadcast is a home for me and yeah. i just you know dig into it um i put myself in the shoe of the listener the end and user for if they're at home watching um yeah. on their tv whatever device and what i want them to hear you know um yeah. and so uh thank you so much for for being a, a great inspiration to me for all these years that's great hey thanks for that man i love it it's it's great yeah. that we kind of able to share and learn things from each other and that's what it's all about yeah there's no competition yeah. we just got to make the best of what we yeah doing, you know? yeah hey, and i must tell you I must tell you, uh, we were mixing a tune and we did like a, a, a live video and put up and you typed on the comment that we should put an eighth note on there, delay. <laughs> and I, I was like, okay. And I came back and I tried it and it worked. And yeah, I was man. like, Stephen, no way my top vote. <laughs> 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 so thank you so much for that. You know, I appreciate it. Great, man. Well, listen, yeah. bless you. Have a fantastic time. I'm going to keep following you as well because I love all your posts. I'm hoping yeah. next year you get a Grammy, okay? I'm going to pray that you pick up and receive a Grammy for the work you do because you deserve it. You're dedicated to the uh, the art and everything we do. So keep yeah. on doing it, man. That's all I can do is encourage you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steve, and I appreciate it. Bless you. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Knut, and be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe. I'll see you next time.